Okay, good morning, everybody. Come on and put your hands together. Come on, who's ready to sing about that freedom this morning? Who the sun sets free is free in thee. Come on, let's sing. I want to clap a little louder than before. Hey! I want to sing a little louder than before.
morning for freedom. Come on, just lift up your voice to him. Just tell him, God, we thank you for that freedom today. God, we praise you for that, Lord. God, we're not here just to sing some songs and then get through some songs and, and have a good time. All oh, that's great, Lord, but we're here to encounter you. So Father God, just reign in this room. God, we thank you for your presence that's here. Come on, just begin to thank him. Lift up just a praise to him. Say, God, we praise you. We're here for you. God, we exalt your name. God, we love you. We thank you for freedom. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? That's right. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Sing that out. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. Jesus died for me. Sing it real loud. Yes, he died. stay in this place with him. God, we love you. God, we love your presence. God, that's what we're here for today. God, not to be entertained. God, but to hang out with you, to spend time with the Father. God, draw us closer. 
love you, Lord. You're welcome in this room. Come on, in your own words, just begin to talk to him. Welcome his presence today. God, we welcome you here. God of revival, just have your way. Have your way in this place. Miracle worker, that's who you are. Come on, just declare who he is. Promise keeper. Perfect in every way. God, you're welcome here.
simple, just say oh circumstances your own life declare this things are possible nothing's impossible with him and there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can't see somebody needs to sing that again sing it till you believe it today because there's no prison wall you can't break through that's right and you can't move we believe that there's no broken body and there's no broken body you can't raise no so that you can save one more time all together declare there's no prison cause there's no prison oh you can't break through come on you sing it real loud minutes just in your own words as I continue playing just begin to thank him begin to declare this truth over your life oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. nothing's impossible for you come on in your own voice just begin to tell him begin to surrender that thing that might be weighing on your mind that sickness that that depression that anxiety begin to just surrender that things are possible all things and there's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save. But things are possible. One more time. Come 
one, just you and God, declare it. There's no sing this this song is called God of Revival and so I've been praying into that this week as we've been as we've been preparing God what does that look like what does that mean what are we singing about and and I think God really placed it on my heart that so many times when it comes to the word revival we're waiting for some kind of faraway event right we're just sitting here saying like well if we have a big you know service or maybe we'll go to some kind of cool conference and there'll be a lot of people there and man that'll be a revival that'll be great And what God is really speaking this morning is that what He wants is the revival to be started right here in your heart. The revival, the fire for God, reviving this city, reviving this country, reviving this world, that starts right here with your worship. It's not some far away event that we're just hoping we make it to. It is something right here, right now, God of revival. It's who He is. He's a reviving kind of God. Come on, do you believe that? It's not something that He's waiting to do someday. This is not just something that he's hoping that we have a big enough event for. He is a revival God. That's who he is to the very core. And he wants to revive your heart. He wants to revive your spirit. The things that might feel dead in you, he wants to bring you back to life in Jesus' name. Come on, give him praise for that. He's the God of revival. God, our prayer this morning is just like we just sang, that you'd pour it out. Pour it out on us, God. God of revival, we've positioned ourselves in a way that we're ready, Father. We want to see that, Father. We're not waiting for some other day or some other service. God, we know that revival is who you are. You've come to revive, you've come to restore. And so we thank you for that. We thank you that you would allow us to be a part of your great revival every day. Not just the big events but the great revival that happens every morning when we wake up and we say, God, use us, send me, Father. That's revival. God, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you that we see the goodness of God in all the land, Father. Even in the midst of chaos, you are good. That's who you are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, give him some crazy revival kind of praise today. Amen, amen. Hey, you can be seated. Check out the screen. Good morning and welcome to Maranatha Christian Center. We are so blessed that you're here today. And if you're watching online, we are so thankful for you joining us as well. Before we continue with the rest of our service, we want to let you know what's happening right here at MCC. We have been talking about this announcement for the last few weeks, but we can't even express how excited we are about it. I'm talking about Crazy in Love, our marriage event. We have been praying over every detail of this event, from the speakers to the schedule, and especially for you. We really want to encourage you to be a part of this because we know that God is in this. It doesn't matter if you've been married for 50 years or you're still waiting for the right one. This event is for you. There has never been a more crucial time to strengthen your marriage or prepare for your future marriage. We will have amazing guest speakers, Mike and Sharon Ulmer, dinner from Burke's Barbecue, giveaways and childcare. It is our desire that this night won't be just another event on your already busy schedule. 
but that this night will be truly life-changing because we encounter God and establish Him as the center of our lives. So we encourage you to join us on Saturday, March 26th from 5 to 9 p.m. For more information and to register, go to our website, maranathadecab.org. That's it for today's announcements. If you'd like to know more about anything you've heard today, you can visit our website or email info at maranathadecab.org. You can also follow us on social media or opt in to get our text updates on your mobile device. If you'd like to give your tithe and offerings, we have giving boxes at the front and back of the room, as well as an iPad station if you'd like to give online. Our MCC kids just wrapped up an exciting time of worship and also have the opportunity to give each week. So kids, if you'd like to, you can bring your offerings right now. Okay. Take a minute to say hi to someone next to you, and if you haven't already done so, you can take your kids, ages birth through eighth grade, to their classes now. We'll be back in a few minutes with an exciting message from our pastor. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Welcome to Daylight Saving Time. <laughs> hey, how many are glad to have Daylight Saving Time? You will be tomorrow maybe, but not today because you lost that hour of sleep last night. Yep. You know, on the Sunday of Daylight Saving Time, when we spring forward, it uh, seems like there's always one or two that we get word that sometimes they go ahead and come on in, but you know, it's 1130 by the time they get here, if they get here on time. And uh, those who stay out and don't, like, don't come in for worship, it's 11.45, 11.50 before they get here. We're already letting out. And some just kind of pull in the parking lot and see, oh, no, I forgot. It, the parking lot's already full. So I, uh, but so if somebody comes in at 11.30, don't turn around and laugh at them, okay? Make them feel welcome. 
They're already going to feel dumb enough when they come in and we close in just a few minutes after they get here. By the way, that's happened a lot of times, so it's not something so far-fetched. But anyway, it's good to see you here this morning. I'm glad to be kind of kind of back to normal. I'm walking a little bit on this, on this and uh, so I'm, I'm enjoying that part of it. And I appreciate your prayers during this time. We're going to have a special prayer today for some uh, individuals who need some healing. We're going to pray and have a special prayer at the end of the service. And uh, just want to kind of give you a little update on where we're going and what's going on next. Don't forget that I know we just had an announcement about registering for crazy in love. You say, well, you know what? I'm crazy. I'm not in love or I'm crazy. I'm in love. I don't need to. Come. You know, whether you're married, not married, you might come and get some. Get some information for somebody that you might need to help in marriage. It's going to be a great fun time. Anytime the body gets together and has, has you know, food, we, we're going to have the three Fs. Food, fun, and fellowship. That's what we're known for, huh? And uh, so just be sure and register and come on. We're going to have a good time. We've already got about 30 people registered, so we'd like to pretty much double that. And uh, it's going to be a little four-hour quick thing and with food in the middle. It's going to be a lot of fun. So today I want you to turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. And while you're turning there, I'm going to share with, with you today the, the narrow road to the will of God. The narrow road to the will of God. I want to give you a little insight into what we're going to do next week. I don't normally do this, but next week uh, I've got this message been kind of building in my, in my mind this morning since it was daylight saving time. And I woke up early, but somehow or another I was thinking what was going on. It just woke up early. I was laying there thinking, and this message continued to build. So next week I'm going to talk on the subject, why in the world are we still here? If we're still here next week, that is. <laughs> so if we're still here next week, that's what I plan to speak on. Why in the world are we still here? So if you would turn with me again to the Bible, Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read a couple of verses right there, starting with verse 13. It says, you can only enter God's kingdom through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. You think, well, that sounds exclusive, doesn't it? Only a few ever find it? Well, I know a lot of people who are Christian, but you know, when you look at the world wide overall, there are millions and millions and millions and millions of people who are not on the road of salvation, who don't understand the plan. There are many who are deceived, many who just choose not to, but there are very few that really find it. Well, today we're going to talk about the narrow road to the will of God. Another scripture I want you to watch it and listen to is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. The good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. You know, the Christian life was never meant to be a solo mission. We're never meant to go this thing alone. We're never meant to be uh, lone rangers. We're in this thing together. And the Bible tells us that. Let me give you a couple examples. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that we're to exhort one another. But you can't exhort one another if we're not with one another, can we? So you exhort one another. And then Hebrews chapter 10 says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. In Galatians chapter 6, it tells to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, the Bible says we're called to be one body, many members, each one very important and dependent on the other. So the Bible tells us we're supposed to come together, we're to draw strength from one another, we're to encourage one another, we're to fellowship with one another. And you know, you can fellowship like we talked about, food and fun. Uh, that's good fellowship, isn't it? But just drawing strength from one another. We're not called to live a solo life. But because living for Jesus in our world is tough. And we've got it much easier than many people do. We've got it much easier than many persons do because in the United States, we still have religious freedom. There's a little bit of persecution. There's a little bit of problem. There's, the world is trying to squeeze the church out, but, but we still have religious freedom. I, I don't come to church every Sunday morning wondering and fearing that someone's going to break through and say, all right, all you're locked up. If you, do, if you don't deny Jesus Christ, we're going to take you to prison. So we have a lot of religious freedom here, but I'm telling you, the, the, to really get out and to serve Jesus, we're in a world that you're going against the grain or you're going against the flow. And you know, if you go against the flow long enough, you finally wear out, don't you? Going against the flow wears you out. Swimming upstream is good exercise, but you can't do it all the time by yourself. We need strength one another. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but the people all around us tend to try to pull us into our old patterns. The world is geared to pulling you back into old patterns, patterns of the world. 
And the Bible says that the world's ways are not God's ways, and those patterns will pull you back into those old patterns. The world is geared that way. The world is not geared to you being an on-fire, dedicated servant of Jesus Christ. I'm sure that at least sometime in your life, maybe not recently since people have finally accepted, if you've been a Christian a long time and people know that you're a Christian, they've probably accepted the fact. But, you know, I can remember, and I bet you can remember times in your life when you first started serving Jesus, you first went out to serve the Lord, and you were going out, and some people would come to you and say, oh, come on, come, don't, don't, don't do that. Come on back with us. Let's have a good time like we used to. Come on back. Get over that old religious stuff, and let, let's get back to having a good time. You want to do that? You know, there's that pull that tries to bring you back to where you used to be. Just come on back, join the crowd. Yeah, the road to heaven is narrow, the Bible says, but I'm going to tell you something else. The road to walking in God's will is even narrower. There are a lot of people who have their names written in the Lamb's book that aren't walking in the will of God. You can be born again and still not be in God's will. That's not a good place to be. You say, well, if I can just get to heaven, that's all I care about. Uh, if you don't have a desire somewhere, somehow, to be pleasing to God, then there might be a problem. I got, I'm convinced that a lot of people who say they're going to heaven aren't really going. Because when I ask people who say, yes, I know I'm going to heaven, I ask them why they know they're going to heaven, and they give me the wrong answer. They say something like, well, I know I'm going to heaven because I was baptized when I was a kid. I know I'm going to heaven because I've, I've tried to do the best I could. I've tried to be, live the right kind of life, so I'm sure I'll get to go to heaven. Most people have... And our ability to justify and rationalize have rationalized the fact that I'm a pretty good person and God is a God of love, so I'm sure I'll get to go to heaven. But there's a narrow road of those who are going to heaven, the Bible says, and there's even a more narrow road or a narrow road that people who are walking in the will of God. So we ask ourselves this question today, am I walking in God's will? Am I walking in the will of God as he would have it? So the Bible mentions the will of God many times and admonishes us to walk in that will. It's evident that God has a will for earth, for mankind, and for every individual. God has a will for you. God has a will for everyone. The Bible tells us about God's will for all mankind. It's very simple. He simply says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires that all men should come to the knowledge of truth and be saved. God's will is for every man, woman, boy, every person alive to be born again. He made it possible. That's why he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He goes on to say in the next verse, because we know that this is not what God wants. He said, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So it's God's will. Now, are you born again today? That's the first step to getting in God's will. You cannot be in God's will outside of God's family. And you can't be in God's family until you get born again. Some say there's three degrees or levels of God's will based on Romans chapter 12 that we read a moment ago. Did you pick those three out? This is the good an acceptable and perfect will of God. They've got this idea that, you know, I don't, if I don't, I don't, I'm not going to get too, quote, religious. I'm not going to get too enthused about it. So I, I'm going to walk in the good will of God. And, you know, if you're walking in the good will of God, it's kind of like making a C. Not too bad. But, you know, if I want to get in the acceptable will of God, I'm going to be acceptable, that'll, that'll be a B. Now, there are some people, but not very many, there are a few who want to get in the perfect will of God, they get an A+. Plus. I want to tell you, God doesn't have three wills, and you pick up what level you want. God has a will for your life, and there's only one will in your life, and that's his will. That's his will. And God's will is all at the same time good. It's acceptable, and it's perfect. So don't say, well, I'm not going to get in the perfect will of God. I just kind of want to slide by with a C. I was tickled to get some C's in college, were you? <laughs> I mean, I, was, I said, man, I was so happy to get that C and run from that class as fast as I could. But I don't want to get a C in walking in the will of God. I don't even want to get a B. I want to get an A+. Plus. I may not have it all the time, but that's my desire. That's my goal. Is it your goal to walk in the perfect will of God today? If it's not your goal to walk in the perfect will of God, you're probably not doing it. If you don't say in your mind, if you don't have it in your mindset, in your psyche, that my goal is to be in the perfect will of God, then you're probably not in that perfect will of God. You're probably somewhere in the other range. Because God's will is either, you're either in his will, you're out of his will. It's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. Walking in the will of God. 
Many times people going through life have expressed to us, I just feel like something's missing in my life. You ever feel that way? Something's missing? I just don't feel like I'm complete. I feel like there's something missing in my life. Maybe you feel that way today. Maybe you feel like, oh, there's just something missing in my life. The Bible has some insight into that feeling and lets us know kind of why we feel that way. Paul, writing to the church in Colossae in uh, chapter 4, uh, said this, Epaphras, who is one of you, he's one of us, he's a bondservant of Christ Jesus. He greets you, laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. See, the Bible wants us to walk in the will of God. It's God's will that we walk in his will. And it tells us that we, uh, we can do that. See, we were created with an unction to do and to be the will of God. You say, what do you mean, be the will of God? Literally in Romans chapter 12, when the Bible says that we might prove what is good, the accept and perfect will of God, that literally means that you might become the will of God. Can you think of yourself as being the will of God? We think of ourselves as being in the will of God, but when we are in the will of God, we literally become the will of God. For it's God's will that you get born again, you did. Now you're the will of God walking on this earth. Walking around this earth, you are the will of God. He wants you to be his will at your workplace, at your play place, on Friday night, on Sunday morning, every other time of the week. He wants you to be his will personified on the earth. Think about that. I can be the will of God. I can go forth from where I am and where I am, I become the will of God to those around me and they see me and they see the will of God being done in an individual and I am the will of God. It's not just something I do, it's what I become. I become the will of God. Remember, you've probably heard me say this before, you were created on purpose, for purpose. God created us to be his will in this earth. Maybe you've heard me say this before, God's will fits you perfectly and you look good in it. You look good in God's will. I love to see people walking in the will of God. You know they're in the will of God, they're just marching right along to the tune of the kingdom of God, kind of, uh, kind of aloof to the tune of this world. They know it's here, they hear the world, they see what's going on, but they're just walking to a different drumbeat because they're in tune with what God's doing. In tune with what God's doing. God's will looks perfect on you. How can I say that? Because it's true. You look good in God's will. You know, unbelievers scoff at the idea of God's will. And oftentimes believers ignore it. When I talk to people sometimes and I talk about trying to be, you know, in the will of God and it's God's will for this. And they say, oh, do you think really God really has a will? You know, I know God just sitting off up there in heaven. He's not watching what's going on. He just, the earth is just kind of turning. And, and yeah, we believe one day he'll intervene again. But right now he's not really involved in things. I'll tell you, he's actively involved. Very actively involved, not in just the affairs of the world, but in the affairs of every individual who will allow them to be. I can tell you this right now, he's more committed to you than you are to him. You say, how do you know that? Because he was so committed to you, he sent his son to die for you. If he sent his son to die for me and I'm not living for him, he's more committed to me than I am to him. Even if I am living for him, he's still more committed than I am. Sometimes I pray, God, I don't, I don't understand why you're so committed because I'm so unfaithful at times. I mess up, I blow it. I do the wrong thing, I think the wrong thing, I say the wrong thing, I stick my foot in my mouth, and you're still faithful to me because he's more committed to me than I am to him. My goal is to be 100% committed at all times, walking in God's perfect and complete will of God. So the question we must, must ask ourselves then, am I living in God's perfect will? Am I living in God's perfect will? I'm asking myself that. I've asked myself that for the last several days as I've been going over this in my mind, in my heart, in my paper, wherever I am. I, am I in? Are there areas that I'm not walking in the will of God? Yes, the Bible speaks very clearly about God's will and that he has a will for everyone. I like what Paul said several times as he wrote to Paul, uh, the scriptures. He said, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It was God's will that he be who he was. And it's God's will that you be who he created you to be. The Bible tells us, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Usually when we think about God's will, our focus is trying to discover it. But more important issue is 
Whether we it's revealed or not, we try to walk in it and be it, become God's will. The road may be rocky at times, and I'm telling you, it's not always easy. Have you ever found that the will of God leads you in uncertain places? Have you ever felt like your uh, faith was being stretched? Like, I don't feel very comfortable in this place right now. I'm, I'm being pulled into something that I don't feel comfortable doing, but I have to depend on God. I want to tell you something. If your life can be characterized by what you can do by your own persona, by your own swab, by your own personality, by your own charisma, charisma is just gifts. God gives us all gifts. You're cool. Everybody's cool. If, you can, if your life can be characterized by your own ability to do things, then you're living below the standard God has. He has a higher standard than that. Yes, the road can be rocky at times. There's a lot of obstacles to go into God's will. Today, we're going to look at some of those obstacles. Here we go. You know, if you're going to successfully navigate the path of God's will, you've got to understand that there are things along the way that can trip you up. But I've learned a good knowledge of the situation gives me more confidence in the situation. If I know beforehand that there are obstacles, then when I see an obstacle, I'll say, well, I knew that was there. I didn't know exactly where it was, but I knew there were obstacles. I knew there were going to be troubles along the way. Jesus said it like this. We've quoted this verse many, many times. In this world, you're going to have some trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We know that. We understand that. When we have those things, sometimes it knocks us back and we think, ah, I wasn't ready for that. But then we say, but Jesus said we're going to have some trouble. See, the Christian life is not a life of ease drifting down a calm river on a nice summer day. It's not that kind of life. The will of God is not a path strewn with rose petals, with lemonade stands at every curve. Oh, let's just stroll on up to this next little lemonade stand and sit down and have a glass of lemonade and enjoy drifting in the will of God. See, drifting in the will of God are con contradictory. We don't drift in the will of God. We press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's a pressing thing. It's something that's in our mind, and we think, I I'm pressing. The Bible said that Jesus pressed. It said when he was telling the disciples what was going on, it said he set his mind like flint to go to Jerusalem. If you don't have your mind set on accomplishing the will of God, you're going to find yourself drifting into the mediocrity of the world. We've got to walk in the will of God and make a mind. We've got to choose to do that. There are many obstacles that hinder us in walking the will of God. So the number one obstacle is self-will. Selfishness. You know, selfishness comes naturally, wrapped up in a little baby. Have you ever noticed that? Babies are born selfish. You think, no, my baby's perfect. I know your baby's perfect, but it's still selfish. The first thing they learn to say beside mama is mine, 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 me, mine. And, and they learn to take things. Have you ever, how do they learn to take things away from other kids so early? That's mine. I want this. And you know what? They're also very impatient in their selfishness. When they want something, they want it right then. If you don't get it right then, what do they do? They start screaming. You, you don't have to teach a kid to be selfish. You got to teach them to be unselfish. So self-will in babies is kind of expected. Self-will in adults is to be neglected. Because when we promote our self-will, by the way, did you know that was the primary sin of the Garden of Eden? You, you think? Oh, no, no, they ate the fruit. It wasn't the fact that they ate the fruit. It's the fact they disobeyed God and said, we want to do what we want to do. The devil tempted Eve and said, if you want to be like God, just do what you want to do. Don't worry about what God said. And so Adam and Eve chose to do what they wanted to do. And now we've got this whole mess. I don't blame Adam and Eve. You'd have done the same thing probably. You've done it many times. We've all chosen to do what we want to do. The motivation for their sin was self-will. Another thing that uh, is an obstacle is influence of others. I'm telling you, we're geared with the herd effect. We like to fit into the herd. And, you know, the herd that you fit with is the one that's going to determine your mindset, your psyche, going to determine how your values, going to determine what you do. And so if you've been in a herd for a long time and you get born again, you get taken out of that herd, you feel a need to go back to that herd, and you want to do what they tell you to do. It's so easy to get caught up in the, the, the pressure of our peers, the influence of others who tell us, oh, don't worry about that. You've got plenty of time to get in God's will. Let's just have fun. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. And that's true. That's all the more reason to get in God's will, isn't it? I don't want to die outside of God's will. And I don't want to live outside of God's will. So the way to do that is stay in God's will. 
You say, well, I don't know how to find God's will. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. How do we find God's will? Influence of others can keep us from walking God's will. The next principle is ignorance of God's principles. How do I know God's will? By his principles. His principles can lead us in his, in his overall will. We know one thing, it's God's will that all be saved. So if you're born again, you started in the process of walking in God's will. God has a, a will for all people. And he has individual wills. You, 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 all individual wills. And our wills, though they are common and the same in general, they're very specific to our individual lives. All of us don't, don't do and aren't called to do and be the same person or the same thing. Some are called to be this place. Some are called to be there. Some are there. But every one of us in that place are called to be in God's will. We can't walk in God's will if we don't understand his principles. The Bible tells how to understand his principles. One of the principles we need to understand is sometimes we've got to wait on God. You know, God's will doesn't all, all the time reveal itself immediately. You say, well, how am I going to know God's will? How am I going to find God's will? What do I need to do to find God's will? I, I, I don't want to wait on it, but you have to sometimes. The, the key is saying, Father, I want to be in your will. What is your will? Then wait till he shows you. Sometimes it may be right there immediately and you're ready to go. Sometimes he says, just be ready. But he, he only wants us to be ready. If we're ready to be in God's will, want to be in God's will, we're in God's will until he shows us. We've prayed many times, God, we know you have something for us. We don't know what it is right now, but we're willing. We want to be in your will. We want to do what you want us to do. So therefore, we're in God's will until he reveals something. Now, if we make the choice to not do that, we just got out of it. But if we continue to do that, we're walking in God's will. Sometimes you have to wait on God's will. Sometimes you have to just trust God and leave the consequences to him. God, I have no idea how this is going to work out. It, doesn't look, it just doesn't look rational to me. Can you imagine Moses? God, I don't know how this is going to work out. I love that message we saw not long ago uh, by Darius, uh, Darius Daniels. I believe, anyway, at the Gateway Conference, he got, the message was titled, I didn't know we were going to go this way. <laughs> you know, I didn't know we were going to go this way. God, I, I'm trusting you, but this doesn't look like the right way. Trust God. Because he brings us ways so that he gets the glory out of it, that we don't get the glory from it. Trust God and leave the consequences to him. The next part, allow God to supply all your need. Boy, I'm telling you, we're, we're going to have to learn that. We're going to learn that. Allow God to supply all your needs. We've lived in such an affluent society that we could just kind of get our needs met by just hop, skipping, jumping along the way. You know, there may be days coming when we have to just trust God for the very bread that we eat. I remember years ago when I was just, just getting serious about serving God, and I was, I was, there was a song that came out that said, uh, talked about uh, end times, and talked about guns and wars and said a piece of bread would buy a bag of gold. You know, maybe it may be that gold is not going to be any good. Your money may not be any good because you can't eat your money. You can cook it and put salt on it, but it's probably not going to be that good. A piece of bread would buy a bag of gold. We've got to learn to trust God. But learning to trust God sometimes is hard to do. Allow God to supply your needs. The next thing is take one step at a time. Take one step at a time. You may not know where you're going to be a year from now, but you don't have to know. I love the scripture in the Psalms. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. People say, well, what does that mean? It means you get enough light to take the next step. Your word is a lamp to my feet so I can, I can see the next step, but I don't know where I'm going exactly, but I know I'm following you. Have you ever prayed this? God, I don't know where this is going, but I know I'm following you. He says, that's okay. That's all you need to know. He said, not only are you following me, I'm following you. Because the Bible says when you walk in the way, you'll hear the spirit behind you say, this is the way, walk in it. You may not understand all the principles and ways of God's will, and you may have to just trust God, but take a step at a time. He said, well, I want to know all the steps so I can see what we're going to do. You may not know all the steps. You just know you're going to take one step at a time and go the direction God says go. Ignorance of God's principles is is one thing that hinders us also willful and known sin. Someone said, well, if you have sin in your life, what do you do? Well, get it out. Willful and known sin will hinder walking in the will of God. Well, I know, I know that's wrong, 
What's the next word? But. People say that. Well, I know this is not right, but, uh, you know, everybody else is doing the same thing, and they seem to be getting along fine. When you want to walk in the will of God, and you're committed to walk in the will of God, that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, you can't say that. Well, everybody else is doing it. When, you, when you've made the choice to walk in the will of God, the high calling of God, as we call it, there are some things people get by with that you can't get by with. You say, well, that's not fair. It is if you want to be in the premier top part of the will of God for your life. Willful known sin will hinder God's work in your life or hinder you walking in the will of God in your life. What does it do? It deafens our ears to the voice of God. We get caught up where we hear what the world is saying. You know, that's what, uh, that's what happened to Lot's wife. She loved where she was, she loved the city. She loved Sodom and Gomorrah so much that God brought them out, but she could hear the sounds of the city. And she turned and wanted to go back. That's what happens to us. We, we hear God's will, but then we hear the sound of the city drawing us. There used to be a time in my life when those, those drum beats would draw me back, and I'd say, I'm not going. There was that tendency to go back. I said, I'm not going back there. What I have is so much better than what was there. I know what was there. I remember what was there. And, you know, his wife, Lot's wife, should have said, you know, I hear that. And I know back that time we fit in. We were real. We had it made there. But you know what? That's not God's will for us. And I'm not going to listen to that drum beat any longer. I'm going to turn. We mentioned earlier that sometimes people try to draw us back in the old way of life. When we choose to walk back by old methods, old ways, uh, and willful sin, it deafens our ears. It clogs our spiritual ears. We don't hear what God is saying. Willful sin blinds our eyes to the vision of God. Even the eyes of faith can see things in faith, but when we're walking in willful sin, we can't see things of faith. We say, I just don't see that. I, don't wanna, I just can't, I can't comprehend that. I don't understand that. I can't see it. My faith cannot grasp that. It hardens our hearts to the awareness of God. Someone said one time, and I heard them say this, it really stuck in my mind, said, if you're not as close to God as you used to be, guess who moved? You see, God hadn't moved away from us. But sometimes, because we choose to be disobedient to God, it hardens our hearts to the things of God, so therefore we're not aware of the conscious presence of God. It turns our hearts away. It dulls our conscience toward the Word of God. If we can read the Word of God and things in there don't, don't prick our conscience, if things in the, in, the, in the Word of God don't convict us, then maybe our conscience has become seared, as it talks about in Timothy. So willful sin is another. The fifth thing that keeps us from walking in the will of God is doubt. The Bible says don't doubt. Walk in faith. We doubt that God has a personal will for our lives. Someone probably thought when I said that this morning, someone said, well, God doesn't have a personal will for my life. I've already gone too far. He doesn't have a will for my life anymore. Yes, he does. Don't doubt God. Go to him and say, God, if there is a will for my life and, you, and, and if you still have something for me, then I want what you want for me. And I'm not going to doubt. I'm, if you have something, show it to me. I remember when I was 22 years old, I thought, man, I was already out. I thought I was so far out, God never want me back. But God said, I've got something special for you. I said, if you've got something special, I want it. And I'm willing to go to let you show it to me. I doubted it. I doubt that God ever heard my prayers because I was throwing prayers up to a brazen heaven and they were bouncing right back. But when God said, I do have something for you, but you're going to have to go and I'm going to show you. Then I said, okay, it's worth it. Are you willing to say, God, I don't know what you have for me. I've even doubted you still have anything for my life. But if you have something for me, I want it. I want it. And whatever it takes, I want to get it. We doubt that the Lord will make his will known. Some people say, well, I don't think you can know the will of God. I know you can. The skeptics may say you can't, but I know you can. They say, no, how do you know that? I said, look, I'm not going to argue with it that I know you can because... My life is not built on an argument. It's built on a fact. See, a guy with an experience is never at the mercy of someone with an argument. The people that don't know this, this stuff, they argue with you and say, you can't do that, you can't know that. I say, it's too late, I already have. <laughs> I love when they, they, they told the disciples, they said, you guys, 
Look, I don't know. There might have been a mighty miracle take place, but stop preaching the name of Jesus. It's too late. We've already seen. We've already heard. We've already touched. We've already felt. We've already been with him. You got to us too late. He's real and we can't stop. I understand the will of God. Many people doubt that God has a perfect will. Cast doubt out. We doubt that we can do what the Lord requires. Well, I don't think I have the ability. I'm not smart enough. I'm not uh, intellectual enough. I, I don't know the Bible well enough. I, I, and people give all kinds of reasons. And that's nothing new. Moses did the same thing. He said, God, I don't think I can do this. I can't be. I already tried once. People said, well, I tried that one time and I failed, so I'm not going to try it again. How would you learn to walk? How would you learn to ride a bicycle? You didn't do it the first time you tried. You tried and failed and tried and failed until you finally made it. So you know what we say, hey, if, you're gonna fall, if you fall down, get up. The only way to get beat is to stay down. Get back up. You may have to crawl up. You may have to get somebody to help you pull you up. You may have to grab one of my crutches and lift yourself up. <laughs> However you, but get back up and say, God, I know I messed up, but I'm ready to go again. <laughs> I can do what you said I can do or you wouldn't have told me I could do it. The Bible says I can be in your will, then I'm going to be in your will because I'm going to be what you said I could do. We doubt because we don't have all the facts. Oftentimes people dilute the facts. They dilute, the world will tell you the facts that aren't the facts, you know, like you hear on the news every day. The facts that aren't the facts. The facts that are, and, and also a lot of times people give you the facts that aren't the facts, even though they think they are doing the facts, because just because somebody writes it doesn't mean it's true. Well, I read in, I read in this book, you know, that, that you, this stuff has passed away. You can't do this anymore. Well, who wrote that book? You say, well, men wrote the Bible. Yeah, the Bible says men wrote, wrote, the, wrote the Bible, but they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he said, God said, this is my word. I watched over it. I breathed it. It's just like I want it to be. So you can trust this. You can't trust what other people write. Just because something's written down doesn't mean it's so. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to go back that far and, and try to do this, but just like Festus Hagen said, how do you know what writ was writ right? Because somebody might have writ something that wasn't writ right, so how do you know it was writ right? See, just because somebody writ something don't mean it's right. There's a lot of people writing things, saying things. The world is filled with misinformation. We don't have all the facts. The sixth reason people miss the will of God is feelings of unworthiness. Go ahead and have those feelings. It's okay. You're not worthy. Admit it. <laughs> We're not worthy. No, no. How can you, how can you go to God and say, God I'm, God, I'm so worthy. If you No, you're not worthy. But see, God loved us when we were unworthy and unloving, and he reached out to us and he says, no, you're not worthy, but I made you worthy. I poured my spirit within you. I brought my home to live within you. And now you are worthy because of what I've done, not because of what you've done. So just go ahead and admit it. The Bible says to, you know, the devil loves to put you down and say you're not good enough. You can't do it. Just, the Bible says agree with the adversary quickly. The devil's your adversary. He tells you you're not worthy. Say, so you know, boy, devil, you sure got that right. I am not worthy. But God's grace and God's mercy has declared that I am worthy and I'm able to do all that he wants me to do. It doesn't have to be, and it can't be, your own worthiness. He makes us worthy. Another thing in, in, in this day and time, this is number seven if you're keeping notes. Another day in, in this day and time, another thing is busyness. Not necessarily business, but busyness. How you doing? I'm so busy. I'm, I'm so busy. I'm so busy I, can't, I catch myself coming back when I ought to be going. I'm so busy. Everybody's busy. Everybody's busy. The thing is, everybody has 24 hours in a day. Business is not an excuse for not walking the will of God. It's, 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 it is an excuse. It's not a reason. Busy, we're all busy. But see, we, we got to delegate time to what we deem important. And if I deem important walking the will of God, busyness will include time with God. It will include giving myself to him. It will include, yes, we all have that much time a day. What we do with our time determines what we deem important. And the last thing is fears in the Christian life. Fears. You have fears? Oh, no, I don't have any fears. I just don't know how I'm going to make it when 
gasoline gets to six dollars a gallon or seven dollars a gallon. I don't know how I'm going to make it <clears throat> when we have shortages. I don't know how we're going to raise kids up in this kind of world. Fears in the Christian life. Sometimes it's not fears of things going around us. It's fears that what God asks of us. Fears of God's requirements. See, following his will may seem too costly to you. If I follow, his, if I follow God, I'm going to have to die to everything else. That's right. If I'm going to walk in God's will, I've got to choose his will above everybody. I've got to choose it above my friends. If you're, if you're willing to allow your social group to hinder you from walking in God's will, they're more important to you than God. Behold your God's. Activities, if you're, if you're letting activities hinder you from walking in God's will, behold your God. If there's anything hindering you from walking in the will of God, then that's your God. It's, you put it between you and God. You know, sometimes people let hypocrites keep them from walking in the will of God. I, if I've heard it once, I've heard it dozens of times. Well, I don't go to church. Too many hypocrites in the church. I say, well, do you go to football games? Well, yeah, I go to football games. There are tons of hypocrites in football games. I mean, there's more hypocrites in football games. There's a lot of people go to football games just sit there and talk. They don't care about the football game. They're just there because they just won't be where the crowd is. But I'm not going to keep going because of hypocrites. Do you, hypocrites go to restaurants. But I'm not going to stop going to restaurants because of hypocrites. I might go if I can't afford to eat there. Just kidding. Fears will keep us from walking in the will of God. Fears of what other people might think about us. Fears of what we might be called to do. Sometimes we don't do it because we're fear of failure. I'm afraid if I try this, I might mess up. We already addressed that a little bit, so we're not going to talk much about it. But yeah, you might mess up. Probably will. Go ahead and admit it. You're probably going to mess up a few times. That's okay. I like it. Mess up, fess up, and get up. You know? Yeah. Here, here's another one. It has to do with what we talked about, peer pressure. Fears of criticism. Who do you think you are? Trying to do this. You're nothing. Are you, you, think you're, you think you're God special? Yeah, I am. You, oh, you're pride now. You got pride. No, the Bible just says that, that God loves me and I'm special to him. And so are you. I walk in the favor of God. But a lot of people will criticize you when you start trying to do the things of God. They'll, they'll call you a holy roller. They'll call you a fanatic. You know, I never heard anybody run somebody down for being a Baseball, basketball, football fanatic, have you? I mean, that's great. Everybody loves to have a, a fanatic. I'm a fanatic about fishing. I'm a fanatic about skiing. I'm a fanatic about hunting. That's great. Go for it. I'm a fanatic about Jesus Christ. Oh, why are you going to do that? Don't be a fanatic. It's okay to have a little bit of Jesus, but don't let it show. Don't talk about it. Nobody gets upset when you talk about the Super Bowl, who won the Super Bowl, the great plays the Super Bowl. Man, that's awesome, wasn't it? Wear the jersey, wear it, go around, you know. You, that's my team. No, it's not your team. You might like the team, but you're, that's not your team. That's the one I choose. I'm a fanatic. What's wrong with being a fanatic for Christ? The word is, it, it, it comes, we get the word fan from it. I want to be a fan of Jesus Christ, don't you? Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm a fanatic for Jesus Christ, he said. The world needs some more fanatics. Well, that might turn people off. They're already turned off. That's why they're that way. If they were turned on, they'd be with you. Go ahead, turn them off. Be a fanatic for Jesus Christ. I don't mean go flaunt it on. Don't beat them in the head with the Bible. Beating people in the head with the Bible never has won anybody. <clears throat> you can run people off with the same food that would feed them. Just live the Christian life day by day in front of them. Be the person of God. And they'll see that. And when they come up on an obstacle that knocks them down, they saw that you walked through it, they'll say, how'd you do that? How can you be like that? Because I've got my faith built on something stronger than this world. I put my faith in Jesus Christ and he gives me strength. And I'm walking in his will, and his will sustains me. See, God's will will never carry you where his grace cannot sustain you. So what do we do with this? Oh, well, we just walk out the door and go home and have lunch. Just one of another sermon. We have 52 a year. Well, it says, number one, this is, check that one off. We did that one. Or do we, or do, do we need to do something with this? Do we need to really 
I mean, is there a response that we need to make or do we just say, okay, good deal. Let's get out. We might get out early if we hurry up. They're waiting. <clears throat> Remember this, real success comes from knowing and following God's will for your life. You want success? That's what real success is. It's not the way the world measures success. It's the way God measures success. You're successful to the degree that you know and follow God's plan, God's will for your life. So I asked this a little bit earlier. Are you presently living in the will of God? Are you? I don't know. If you don't know, you can know. How do you know? Ask him. And say, God, if I'm not, show me what it is. Does it seem like something might be missing in your Christian life? Maybe it's not the level you think. Maybe you see somebody else and you think, I want the kind of life they have, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it might be related to how much time you spend praying and asking God to fulfill his will in your life. What, if anything, is hindering your walking in the perfect will of God? Is anything hindering your walking in the will of God? Is there a relationship that's hindering? A friend? Work? Are you having to do things at work that are not in God's will and you know it's not God's will but you're afraid to not do them because if you don't do, you might lose your job. Are you trusting your job to meet your needs or God? Maybe if you turned your back on what's hindering, something greater will open up. We started out with this scripture. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide. For many choose that way, but the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few find it. A narrow gate implies a narrow road, maybe even a difficult road. When we lived in Colorado, we made a lot of trips from Grand Junction to Durango and to get from Grand Junction to Durango and back, you have to go across this little place called Red Mountain Pass. You might have heard of it. Red Mountain Pass is a difficult road. It's a very narrow road. It's a very winding road. And sometimes you find yourself, and when you're coming down Red Mountain Pass, you find yourself going the opposite direction of the way you wanted to go because it winds back and forth, back and forth, comes back, goes the other way. But you want know, to tell you, it's a very narrow road, a very winding road, sometimes a very difficult road. You'll find icy spots on that road. And I'll tell you what, it might be a difficult road, but it's so much better than what the alternative is going off of it. God's will might be a winding road. It might be a difficult road, but it's so much better than being off of it, being out of it. All along the way of Red Mountain Pass, you'll find crosses sticking up where people got off and went off the 1,000-foot drop-off, the 500-foot crashed. All along the pathway of our lives, we see where people got off God's will and ran off and their lives crashed and burned. Maybe not physically, maybe just emotionally, spiritually, relationally, because they missed God's will. See, the result of missing God's will can be very catastrophic in our lives. So not only is the road to God, the will of God narrow, the perfect will of God is not just the narrow road, it's that line right down the middle of it. It's more narrow than you think. Are you in the middle of God's will today? I want you to bow your head with me. The times that we're living in are very uncertain times to say the least. We started this uncertain time business just about two years ago this month, didn't we? When we said life has changed in the United States probably forever. At that time, we were talking about COVID. Well, COVID kind of has taken a second shelf, second place now because there's other things that are on the horizon. Shortages. World War III looming on the horizon. If we didn't know that God was in control, we could be very fearful, couldn't we? I'm telling you, this is the time not to shirk responsibility, not to shirk Christianity, but to put it on, embrace it full speed. God, I don't know what's going on, but you do. You hold the world in your hands. What's going on? Why is this like this? I'm scared. 
I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm raising kids up and I don't know how to raise kids up to face a world like this. But God, you do know. And we're here for such a time as this. This is our time in the sun. This is our time on the spectrum of life. Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to influence my wife, my husband, my family, my children, the people I work around? How am I supposed to be an example of Christ Jesus to people around me? What can I do? What you can do is say, God, whatever it takes, I want to walk in your perfect will. I don't want to get by. I don't want to slide through. I want to get right in the middle of your will. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to do what you want me to do. If you're watching online, what about you? Are you in the middle of God's will? Are you playing back and forth from side to side, ditch to ditch? This is not a time to go in the ditch. The time to get on that white line right down the middle. And say, I'm not going to veer off to the right or to the left. I want to stay in it. In just a moment, we're going to stand. And when we stand, I'm going to pray over us in a moment. <clears throat> but when we stand, if you need to make a fresh commitment to Christ, you want to say, you know what? I want to just let everybody know that today I've made a choice. I want the middle, I want the middle of God's will. I'm choosing that today. And I'm going to walk in that. I'm going to count the cost and I'm going to say whatever it costs, it's worth it because I've been the other way. I've seen what it's like outside of God's will. I want to be in God's will. If you're here today and you say, I don't know if I'd go to heaven if I died or not. This is not a time to play roulette with your eternal destiny. The Bible says very clearly you can know that you have eternal life. You don't have to walk out of this place hoping, wishing, or thinking. You can know you have eternal life. Because the Bible says it's very clear, very simple steps, what you do. We'll have someone here at the front to show you and talk with you. As we stand right now, if you need to come forward, we have some people coming to the front. You need to come forward. Come on right now. Real quickly. Don't wait. You can do, oh God of wonder, the power has no end. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you. Things you've done before in greater measure you will do again. There's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move. All oh, things are possible, and there's no broken. Body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save. All things are possible. Cause there's no about a choice you need to make. You can't break through. And you're saying, no, I really want that, but somehow I'm holding back. Move. Don't hold back. No, if you need to come, come on real quickly right now. There's no broken. You can't raise no soul that you can't save. All things are possible. There's no prison wall you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. All things are possible. We want to uh, take a moment to pray for Bailey. Many of you know that she's been having some very, very serious physical issues. And the doctors don't know what they are right now, but God knows, doesn't he? And uh, so we're going to pray over her. Would you, if, if some of you, go ahead if you want to come and, and agree with us here. But I want you just to stretch your hands out over this way. And uh, we're going to pray. I'm going to anoint you with oil, Bailey. Is that okay? The Bible says that we anoint with oil and pray, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Father, we thank you right now for the power of prayer. 
We just agree and pray over Bailey. We speak in the name of Jesus to the powers of darkness that are come against her body. We command this body to line up with the will of God and the word of God by the stripes of Jesus. We were healed, therefore she was healed and she is healed in Jesus' name. We declare it from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. We pray that whatever's causing this paralysis on her left side to be gone in Jesus' name. Spirit of infirmity, loose her right now. Be gone in the name of Jesus. We command you to the pit from which you came. You have no right to stay. You have no person, uh, a place to be here. We declare that she belongs to you, Jesus Christ, and she's your child. You, you belong to Jesus, Bailey. You know that. She's agreeing right now. She says she is. So, Father, we agree. And spirits of darkness, you heard that. You have no place. Your legal ground is taken. We withdraw every permission granted to you, every opportunity you've been given in Jesus' name. We declare it. We believe it. We receive it. In Jesus' name, so be it. Be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. So. Amen. All right. Things are possible. Let's sing this one more time. And there's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save. All things are possible. God, we just thank you this morning, Lord. God, that that is the truth. Father, that you really are that good. God, we thank you that you're the healer. God, we thank you for healing that we've seen. We believe even this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness all over this place. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege that it is to gather together and worship you, Father. It's such an honor, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Come on, give him some praise this morning. Amen. Come on, let's go out with that same excitement. Remember, if you're new around here, our pastors would love to meet you. They're over at the Info Center, the double doors to your left. They're excited to get to know you. We'll see you later.